Hello, everybody. Lisa Borders here. I have the privilege of serving as a board member of Operation Hope, and I am so thrilled to also have the pleasure today of moderating a conversation with Xander Lurie. This guy is the CEO of SurveyMonkey. SurveyMonkey, you want to know what that is? Well, hold on just one minute, and we're going to get all into it. You ready? Let's go. Welcome, Xander. So great to have you with us today. Hey, Lisa, nice to see you. Thanks for your time. Absolutely. Listen, Xander, we want a level set for everybody. I've used SurveyMonkey in the corporate environment as well as in my personal life, running my homeowners association and getting information back from my fellow residents. Can you help us understand what SurveyMonkey is, when it started, what was the vision when it all started? Sure, Lisa, it's, uh, it's fun to share this story with entrepreneurs. And the SurveyMonkey story is one of great American entrepreneurialism. Uh, Ryan Finley founded the company in 1999. He was working at an online music company and his manager wanted him to collect some feedback. He couldn't find a great tool or platform to use, so he wrote some code and asked some questions. The people, the respondents who took the survey loved it and asked him where they could sign up. That, led him to start a business, which he he wrote the, the, the first tool for SurveyMonkey and really did all the work. He was the customer service rep. Uh, he handled the finances. He was a, he was a one-man band until he hired his brother. He hired 12 other people. Uh, the company grew obviously quite remarkably from then. And today we are 1,350 people strong around the world. Um, the business is public under the ticker symbol SVMK. And really it is about a feedback platform that lets people collect the feedback they need to take the next best action. Our mission is to power the curious. We believe that people with a growth mindset are the people who listen to their stakeholders, they listen to their customers about how to deliver world-class products. They listen to their employees, what's important about their growth opportunities. They listen to their shareholders and to the community. So we help the world's largest businesses like Coca-Cola. We help the world's smallest businesses educational institutions, nonprofits in 170 countries. We answer over 30 million questions a day on our platform. And today the business is um, pretty good size. We're about a three and a half billion dollar business with aspirations to be a lot larger. Wow, Xander, that's a, that's a lot of people you got working with you and a lot of data sets that you're collecting. Jeez, oh Pete, that's fantastic. Tell me a little bit about you and joining the company. I know you were on the board since 2006, I think, but took the role as CEO in 2016. So help me understand what attracted you from the role you previously had to come and lead this organization. Sure. So this the story of, of my association with SurveyMonkey is um, uh, it's a it's a it's a journey that really was born out of friendship and. Um, my friend Dave Goldberg, who was a, a well-known entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, beloved mentor and friend to many, uh, was recruited by Spectrum Equity and Bain when they bought the business from the founder in 2009. Dave fell in love with the business model and saw a huge opportunity to take this business global. And at the time when they had, as I mentioned, 12 employees, he asked me to join the board. So this is in late 2009, which I did. And I was fortunate enough to kind of ride shotgun with Dave, watching him grow this business. and translating the site into dozens of different languages and accepting in currencies all over the world. Uh, the business went through an incredible period of growth. And then on May 1st, 2015, we were on vacation in Mexico, actually, for a friend's 50th birthday. And Dave sadly um, died tragically uh, of a heart attack at the age of 47 while on an elliptical machine. So the board uh, reconvened uh, two days later back in California. Uh, I took on the role of interim executive chairman, and we helped set a path to, to really save the company's team and strategy. Uh, we hired another CEO who didn't work out, and then the board asked me to take the job full-time, uh, which I did starting in January of 2016. Okay, so that was a little bit tumultuous, but it all landed perfectly, obviously, because you're there and the company is growing and growing well. Now, a lot of people might ask, were you really prepared? You had been on the board, so you understood how the company worked and what the mission and the vision was for the founder because you knew him and you knew what he was trying to accomplish. But oftentimes entrepreneurs think they don't have the academic training or the experiential training. 
And I remember teasing you in a previous conversation about having attended law school and business school here in Atlanta, but you had lots of other experiences. Can you talk about those that perhaps added information or added skill sets or expertise to your portfolio of skills before taking on this role? Sure. Yeah, I had a great experience in Atlanta at Emory for four years. I did the JD MBA program. And I can't say that I went in with a, a, a chart for my career trajectory. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I was growing up. I didn't have a five year plan. I was interested in the law that led me to business school. I was enamored with the, the business school. In fact, uh, the prior dean of Emory, um, of course, that uh, uh, Erica James, who's now the, the dean at Wharton, is on our board of directors at Survey Monkey. So I have some strong ties to the university, but I went into investment banking at JP Morgan, which I did for seven years. Um, my, my finest memories of being at JP Morgan were being on deal teams and helping companies achieve great results. And so I wanted to actually be working with one of my clients. I joined a company called CNET Networks, uh, became the CFO there. We sold the company to CBS. Uh, and then when I left um, SurveyMonkey, I was a GoPro at the time. I was leading the entertainment division. And in fact, I'm now on the board of GoPro. So my career, probably like yours, Lisa, has been a winding one with ups and downs and meeting great mentors and hopefully learning some things along the way. Um, your first question about becoming CEO, you know, this is the first time I've ever been CEO. I'm not the founder of the company, as I just mentioned. Um, I think there are a million different ways to be CEO. This is the way I know how to do it. Uh, I'm learning every day on the job. I'm screwing up even more frequently. Um, but I think if you have a growth mindset, if you're asking questions, if you're listening, if you're trying to iterate and improve, uh, improve your delivery, your products, your service, uh, you can be better. And I hope I'm better today than I was four years ago. But um, we've seen, especially in 2020 with COVID, with all the racial injustice that we've been battling with economic recessions that come you know, every five or seven years, um, these jobs are challenging. They pull at your every skill set. Um, and I think there's a, there's a lot of different ways to be successful in this role. But I know that being on the side of your stakeholders and being a person who listens and learns is the most likely path to finding the right answers. Yeah, well, you were awful, awfully candid and authentic here, and I absolutely love that. Talk a little bit more about your leadership style and your approach, particularly in difficult times like these. Uh, we all are trying to stay connected, not only to our shareholders, but our stakeholders. And you talked about that a little bit, but I want to dig a little bit deeper because I have a feeling that you might be doing some things that others may not be doing and perhaps could learn from. Can you talk about your style of staying connected with your colleagues? Sure. You know, I, I think like many other CEOs, I have a, um, a number of networks that I rely on quite heavily for listening and for learning. Um, so I, I work closely with other B2B companies in, in the SaaS arena, asking questions about how they go to market, how they price, how they take care of their customers, um, their, how they build their culture. And, you know, I think as a CEO, I'm often asked, you know, what function do I spend most of my time with? And I think for me, at least, especially in 2020, the answer is human resources. Um, I think the, the most important decisions I make are who are the people, who are the leaders who are going to have the most influence on our culture, on our values, on our business model. So I try and surround myself with people smarter than me, especially in their respective functions, give them a ton of autonomy, make sure we create an environment where they can do the best work of their lives. So I ask a lot of questions, I listen, I try and influence, persuade, cajole. Um, I'm not actually making a ton of decisions every day. I'm really trying to make um, an impact in the part of the business where I can hire great people. Of course, setting strategy, setting budgets. There are a handful of very important decisions I make every year, but the most day-to-day -day interaction I have is really making sure that the you know, the dozen or 20 people who are around me on a daily basis and who are managing the other 1,300 people at the company are high integrity, hardworking, really smart, passionate people who want to win. And that really is the best thing I can do because, you know, like, like everyone else, I have three kids and a wife and a whole bunch of other responsibilities. I'm not up 24 seven um, designing our website or selling our products. There are a whole lot of people who are actually making the magic happen. So. My job is to help steer with great people. 
you know, that sounds fantastic. It sounds like you've got a culture there where everybody is doing their part and they understand where the boat is supposed to go and where they sit in terms of rowing that boat and having it go in a forward motion. You talked about the difficult times that we're in right now during COVID, and this is a particularly tough time, not only with the pandemic, but with all the social unrest and the economic turmoil that we're in. You did recently make a big decision about your vendors and how you're going to run your company. Can you talk about the vendor and supplier program around diversity and inclusion that you guys have just announced? Because I haven't seen that in many other places. I've seen individual companies make a commitment for their internal employees and what they're going to do, but extending that beyond the, the very immediate, I have not seen. Can you talk about that? Sure. And just to reference what you said before, Lisa, you know, your your culture is really tested in times when you're under duress, when there is the most acute stress. That is the time where your culture really matters. You know, we have values like every other company and they're painted on posters and they're on our website, but they don't really matter until you are put in a position where you have to make calls based on your values. And this year has been one where we are constantly under the microscope of of tension in the system and you know i haven't i haven't been to the office since march i haven't talked to a customer in person since then we haven't seen our shareholders i haven't spent time with my my team in person you know it's it's difficult over zoom the latency and kind of reading body language can be difficult when there's nine or 12 squares on on a so this year with the you know, the economic and the the fear people have had and stocking up on dried food and toilet paper, which led to all the racial injustice protests happening in our cities, wildfires, the election uncertainty. There's a lot. You know, as it relates to your question about the vendor diversity, it actually was born out of a discussion I had with John O'Brien in May. We were going on CNBC right after George Floyd was murdered. And we had a discussion about how do we, how do we, meaning I, white allies, have a bigger impact? How do technology CEOs make a bigger difference. You know, it's it's pretty unfulfilling to tweet and feel like you did your part. So we really put together a program I'm, I'm quite proud of. And frankly, I'm I'm singing my own book here because SurveyMonkey is a part of how we make this come to fruition. But we created this vendor diversity initiative and we recruited 22 other companies to join us, including Intuit and Zoom and Slack and Zendesk and the Golden State Warriors. Mass Mutual saw us on CNBC and asked to be a part of it. And what it is, is we look at where do we spend our money outside of SurveyMonkey, our food vendors, our marketing agencies, our cloud services companies, our real estate uh, broker, our banks, our auditors, our law firms. We spend $100 million a year. And some of the companies in our consortium spend a billion plus a year. And we wanted to ask, how are they prioritizing the values that we hold dear? How are they valuing diversity, equity, inclusion? What does their leadership team look like, their board? How are they investing in inclusivity? Because we're spending money with them. And you know, we've said, we don't want to let perfection get in the way of progress. And we are not perfect. And I don't want to throw stones from a glass house. But if we are trying to get better, I want to spend our money with vendors who share the same values. So we're collecting feedback via surveys. And we are going to work with people who share our values and who want to make the world, especially the US, more equitable. And we've got a long way to go. We've seen that in 2020. But thus far, the, the response from our, from our vendors and other companies has been phenomenal. And I think we're going to make an impact here. So I'm really pleased to hear that. And it sounds like, and I've done a little bit of research on your company, and just affirm for me, if you would, it seems the audio is matching the video, whether it's your board composition or whether it's your senior team. Am I right? I'm, I'm really proud of our of we have a board of directors of 10 people, five men and five women, including two black women. I believe we're the only public company in America with two black women on our board. That may have changed. I hope it has. Um, our leadership team um, is 50-50 men and women. Uh, it's too white. We do not have enough black and brown colleagues on our leadership team. And it's something I am responsible for. I am accountable for. I have not done a good enough job. I have not prioritized it with the same vigilance that we drive our product strategy or our sales strategy. And so that's why we don't have the results there yet. I'm changing that and we are putting more focus there. So I, I'm looking forward to having better numbers to share on that front. Uh, across the company, we have terrific gender balance. About 45% of the company is female. 
And while our benchmarks for underrepresented minorities are better than the peer group, they're embarrassingly low. Silicon Valley is historically bad at providing a really diverse environment. We need to do better. We need to do a better job recruiting. And once we um, recruit, we need to do a better job of creating an inclusive culture where people feel truly rewarded. And until we can change how we act, we're not going to get the kind of results we need. So I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing. I'm encouraged by companies who are now elevating the e &I to be as important as anything else we do. And that can only be measured by how you spend your time and your money. And at SurveyMonkey, we are doing that. So thank you. I hope the audio matches the visuals. Um, but this is a journey. We've got a long way to go. We've made a little bit of progress, more so this year than prior years. But I'll look forward to getting on the screen with you here in three years and talk about a report card. That works for me. And I just have to tell you, Xander, looking at other CEOs and other companies, particularly what I would call legacy companies, uh, there are not two people of color. There are not necessarily two women or 50% women and 50% men. So I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm going to hold you to that because I love the enthusiasm and the commitment, uh, but you are, you are leading edge here. And so that's great. Thinking about SurveyMonkey as a force for good, if we could pivot to the future, what would you tell your fellow CEOs about how they could join this journey or why they should join this journey? We all have seen the McKinsey studies that talk about diversity being a real asset and a real benefit to performance uh, and a leverage for performance, but it seems there are still some folks who do not believe. So help me understand how SurveyMonkey and what you all are doing could be a prototype, if you will. Well, I think you said it well, Lisa. I mean, first and foremost, your business is stronger when you have a diverse environment, when you have equitable pay practices, when you have promotion practices that make people feel truly valued and inclusive. It makes for better businesses. We have 300 50 different, com uh, 350,000 different organizations that pay us, over 750,000 paying customers. Our customers are diverse. And how can we be making product decisions and marketing decisions and decisions of how we go to market if we don't have and celebrate that kind of diversity? So there's a ton of data for CEOs that still need to read McKinsey studies that diverse businesses make for better businesses. Those folks are frankly behind. You know, they, they really are operating with a 20, 20th century playbook. So the, the, the data is conclusive at this point. Every cutting edge company understands that diverse environments provide for better work environments. And frankly, the white employees in your company, they want to work in a, a, a more diverse environment. Nobody feels proud working in an all white male you know, fraternity. So we know that the data is there and it's on us to do a better job. And ultimately, if your customers are happy, if your shareholders are getting better results, what CEO wouldn't want to get on board? And so I think for most of us, it was really just about making sure it was a top shelf initiative that warranted the time, kind of time and attention. It doesn't go without risk. I think there are a lot of folks who still feel these waters are uncharted, that what you say uh, can feel risky. There's been a lot of discussion about how much politics can come to work or what people are calling slacktivism. Uh, people talking about social issues in work channels. So it's not it's not unusual for that to feel uncomfortable if you're an engineer or a salesperson who became CEO and that's that's where you spend your time. But mm -hmm. for me, you know, we know that 68% of Americans want CEOs to discuss important issues at work. And for me, you know, I tell our employees, I'm pretty open about my political persuasion. I'm not trying to convince them, but I will stand up and speak for issues that warrant um, concern about our employees' safety, their right to vote, their compensation. And we've seen this administration take some stances that frankly put our employees at risk. And if our employees are put at risk as the CEO of the company, it's my responsibility to stand up and protect them, regardless of whether it's a Republican or Democrat um, who is taking the, those stances. And so I think every CEO should take her or his path towards how to best lead the company. But for me, it's about protecting our employees, building a great, valuable business. And I see a lot of alignment around investing in DEI, and our board shares that, shares that view as well. 
understand if we were to talk about that fear for just a moment, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I hear it so often that people are deeply concerned that their world will be shattered, their traditional world. And you said it perfectly. These are people who are perhaps playing out of the 20th century playbook. But how do we neutralize that fear? How do we, I'm not sure people of color can actually do that. I think it might be our white allies who can do that. But give us some guidance there, because those of us who are trying to navigate the different cultures, the different environments every day, we are culturally competent, moving from one place to another and back again. How can we help you as a white ally with your brethren who are leading most yeah. of the fortune 500s, 1,000s. Well, you're right. I mean, the the, the data is, you, you can't argue with the facts. White men are running the biggest institutions in this country. And the percentage of female CEOs and black and brown board members at large companies is pathetic. And we have, the data demonstrates there is systemic racism that needs to be addressed. So if opportunity is unequally available. We know the talent is. The system is not working to the benefit of everybody. It has been benefiting the white male for too long. So what do you do as a white ally to make sure that you are providing every different opportunity with education, recruiting, promotions, marketing of your products um, to enable a more equitable world, um, especially in corporate America, which has so much power. You know, corporate America today has so much more power relative to prior decades. If you look at the value of these companies, the balance sheets, the number of employees, and just frankly, our ability to get stuff done relative to Washington where you need, uh, you know, there's so much bureaucracy. So I believe it is on leaders who have the ability, who have control of their corporate balance sheet, strategy, pipeline, who have influence with their board of directors um, to step up and play a bigger role and spend more time and more money championing initiatives uh, to celebrate a more diverse environment and to provide more opportunities so that we can have a, a leadership uh, across America that we're more proud of and that is more, more inclusive than the one we have today. Xander, let me just thank you. We're gonna put you on the speaking circuit so you can help drive these points home because I think you will be uh, a resource for others, not only CEOs, but other companies who are feeling uncomfortable in this moment in time. They feel like they're being yeah. threatened by uh, all types of black swan events, potentially the pandemic being first among equals. Um, but I wanna thank you for the work that SurveyMonkey is doing and the leadership that you are exhibiting, understanding we are definitely on a journey. All of us yeah. are on a journey. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I definitely don't have all the answers. And again, hold me accountable for what kind of results we're able to demonstrate over the next three years. I know this, if you can't put up great business results, as a CEO, you lose your platform to talk about social issues as well. So, you know, I, I'm constantly talking to our leadership team, and our employees about the needs to both invest in short term and long term initiatives for our business, as well as building a great, valuable, high growth, profitable business and investing in DE&I issues because we lose our soapbox and we lose our our baton to to champion these initiatives if we don't build a great business. Now, you know, you've seen CEOs do it well and do it poorly. And, you know, there's recently, you know, Coinbase uh, CEO is, you know, he, he put his memo out there about his belief that these political issues should stay out of the workplace. And you've seen quite a bit of backlash from the company as well as in public. Um, I think there's a different path for everyone. But, you know, I think first and foremost, as a CEO, you need to ask, what do your employees care about? Because there's such a, a commingling today of work and life, especially in COVID land. I'm surprised my one of my young kids hasn't come in here. Um, we're all getting so much more intimate into our homes, into our work. And if your employees are feeling acute stress um, about their safety, about prejudice, about their development opportunities, I don't know how you can build a world-class business and not reflect and spend time investing in what your employees care about. Well, I think you're exactly right. But, you know, in the old days, traditionally, I can recall when the mantra at 
uh, any corporate environment was command and control, do as you're told. And it has evolved over time. And some folks think it has gone too far. I, for one, believe we are in the right place that you can't just separate people. We're all at work here. We're all at home tomorrow and never the twain shall meet because real life yeah. enters into people's behaviors. And if they are not happy campers, it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. They're not as productive. They're not as creative. They're not as engaged. It's it's just that simple. So we are almost out of time, but I just wanted to ask you a couple more things about the future. Sure. If you had a magic wand and you were to uh, sprinkle pixie dust over your company, what would you want your company to stand for in the future? Would it be the same thing you stand for today? Would it be evolved in some way? And what type of behaviors would you take on to ensure that you got to that next place, that next level of performance? Well, I, I'm proud of how we're operating today. The company is growing through a very challenging environment. I think you said it earlier, Lisa, you know, there's sports analogies, there's, you know, rowing, the, rowing in the same direction. Ultimately, you know, for me, we know you can't do everything well. You can do a few things well, and if you really focus and execute and trust each other, you can execute brilliantly. And that's what we're trying to do is just really get aligned around a handful of initiatives that if we are successful, we're going to deliver world-class products for our customers and be able to grow the company profitably, as well as supporting the community and each other throughout. So if I had to put you know a little bit of pixie dust across the company, it would be to constantly focus on execution. Execution is always the differentiator. The strategy sessions and whiteboards are for the museums, but execution is what separates, you know, the brilliant companies from, from the pack. Xander, you are fantastic, my friend, and we are so grateful to have been able to spend this time with you from all that you bring to the table and execution being the final topic or the final statement to all the entrepreneurs that are out there and even those who are in the traditional corporate environments. If you don't execute, you got nothing at the end of the day. So let me just thank you on behalf of Operation Hope for all that you're doing at Survey Monkey, uh, but certainly all that you're doing in the community as well. And keep your flat platform, dude. We, we are loving it that you're standing up for well, all that you believe that the company believes in. I've learned a good bit from you as well, Lisa, and please do give my best to JHB. Uh, and thanks for being a customer and, and for inviting me on to, to meet with your audience today. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Be well. Take care.